from the retail perspective, are there things that can be done to make a customer feel safer uh, from a, a shopping perspective? For the retail environments, I, I think cleanliness is going to be a big one. And really, I think it's a matter of making sure that your app platform and your in-store experience, that that customer experience Synonymous. There's nothing more frustrating than having one experience on one platform and, and then it not being consistent on the other platform. Welcome into the Independent Thinking Podcast. This is your host, Rob Stotts. One of my favorite things about Gory, a uh, recent addition to the Nationwide Marketing Group vendor roster, uh, is just how similar you know they are uh, as a as a business as a company. You know, I know they are a vendor, not an independent retailer per se, but uh, the business itself is Gory, 130 years old, multi generation owned, and a business that has had to adapt and evolve over time. And they faced a lot of the same challenges that independent retailers have, and they work closely with independent retailers to you know, help them build out retail activations and help brands to better tell their stories at a retail setting. And, uh, you know, it's so cool to get the opportunity to talk to them and see how, you know, that experience sort of translates into the work that they do on a daily basis for retailers. So we took the opportunity, uh, you know, obviously a lot over the past year has forced retailers to adapt and evolve. And, uh, you know, we wanted to catch up with Gory and chat with them about some of the trends that they're following in the space. What retailers are going to have to do, uh, you know, to make customers feel more comfortable shopping at their stores, what opportunities exist for, you know, them to improve their in-store experience and what this whole COVID thing has done to retail and get their perspective on things and just chat about it all and, and see what they have. They're the experts. Let them do the talking and help us shed some light on, uh, you know, some of the changes that will outlive this pandemic and um, you know, help retailers to get ready to adjust to those new lives as we return to it, not having to worry about going to shop in stores. So Ashley Gorey, CEO at Gorey, was uh, very excited to finally get her on uh, the podcast, and she had a lot to say, a lot of great insights, and looking forward to sharing it with you. So let's dive into this Independent Thinking Podcast with Ashley Gorey of Gorey. All right, we are back on the Independent Thinking Podcast and really excited right now. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I've, I've been trying to get in touch with Miss Ashley Gorey of Gorey up there, and I know you're north of the border. I, I don't know if the, you know, just the, the connections are different when you try to get to a Canadian and an American to talk, but finally we're here and I'm, I'm happy to have you on. So Ashley, I appreciate you, uh, you taking the time and, and calling in from up there in the middle of a snowstorm. I <laughs> uh, think so much, Rob. Yep. No, good, good neighbors. We are not, not a, not a bad connection. No, not one bit. Not one bit. I, I know you guys have the, uh, the reputation of being very friendly up there north of the border Canadians. So I, I expect nothing but <laughs> kindness. <laughs> so. Nothing but kindness. And, and I might say sorry a lot. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Oh, uh, no, that's awesome. Well, uh, like I said, thank you for, for taking the time. And I know we have some really cool stuff we want to dive into and, uh, you know, you've been making the podcast circuit, so I, I had a chance to kind of pre-listen to another episode with you, and uh, not that I'm going to steal questions, but I, I love the direction of that, and so you're 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 a pro at this at this point, so I uh, look forward to, to diving into some really cool topics with you, and um, you know, I, I want to start, you know, Gory, I think, did you guys, you guys made your primetime debut in Houston in February, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Right before uh, so the pandemic locked everything down, but it was a great experience. What an amazing group of membership and uh, the team at Nationwide. I, I had just an excellent experience and um, just thank the world of the association and, and the members. Yeah. So, well, glad that you got to at least that one face to face before we all got shut down. But, uh, you know, for the members that weren't in Houston or that didn't get a chance to kind of swing by and see what you guys were doing with the, the area there, uh, just give kind of a brief overview on, on Gory and what it is, the, the services that you provide. Yeah, sure. Um, so so Gory is a retail activation company. Uh, we help brands and retailers bring their environment to life uh, for the customer at the point of commerce. And I uh, started in a conversation with Derek about the tiny home and how do we tell this really integrated uh, Internet of Things or connected home story 
uh, where we're able to show, demonstrate how products can integrate uh, in an environment that looks like something that you might live in uh, and not a lot of stores necessarily have that uh, and feel. But we had a booth set up to show just, uh, just what it took to bring all of those components and all of those products together. Uh, that's awesome. And and I know the cool thing about Corey is that, you know, you guys have a, a very sort of similar a history and, and feel to you as a company, as a lot of our independent retailers. I mean, you're family owned, I think 130 years. Is that right? The the history of Gory? 135, I think. Wow. That's crazy. So it's been around for a bit. Um, you know, knock it in 21st century being the, the third century you're active in, which is crazy to think about. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's cool to see that, you know, there's in the vendor community, someone that can relate a lot, I think, to, to independent retailers and kind of what our, uh, what our members have to sort of exist and how they exist and what they go through on a daily basis. Oh, absolutely. I love the independent category. Uh, actually, I've spent much of my career working with the independent category in other areas, and um, there's a real heart there um, and the multi-generational piece. It's not easy. I mean, family businesses are not for the faint of heart. Entrepreneurism is not for the faint of heart. And uh, you combine those two and it's, it's, a, it's a, 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 wicked, a wicked combination. But um, no, I think, you know, learning about uh, the, the industry from family brings a whole new layer of um, depth and understanding of what it takes to get there, not only as an entrepreneur, but to see the passion and the understanding of products. Uh, so I, I, I really relate, actually, to a number of your members, um, certainly transitioning from generation to generation. Also, you know, to put your own stamp on it and to put your own perspective as to what the industry or customers want to see from you um, while layering in that history is, is really um, it's a challenge. But it's also it's a beautiful thing when you see it come to to reality. Yeah. And, and I mean, you kind of touched on it there, but do you think you know, having that sort of the the family owned vibe to your own business does that help you relate to, you know, what? I mean, we're talking specifically nationwide, but other independent businesses that that you get to engage with. Yeah. Um. So history repeats itself. Um. You know, like a. I hope the pandemic doesn't repeat itself, but history does repeat itself. And um. You know, there's there's a lot of learning that we can take from, from the past and um, you know, what, what communities, what governments, what businesses have gone through. And I think if we take those learnings and we apply them uh, to how we run and lead our organizations or our teams or, you know, what products we decide to align with, um, I think that that really um, can define the, the organization or define the company. Um, I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> no, that, I think it does pretty well. And, um, you know, it, it's just, it, you know, having that, the, the idea that you can kind of, you, you do face, I know you're, you, you assist retail in sort of the way they, they activate in their stores and things like that. So there is a lot of alignment there, but even just from the standpoint of, you know, how you run your business and how you, like you said, you hand it off from generation to generation and try to put your own stamp. Um, you know, that's something I know a lot of these guys face on a daily basis. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of similarities that are kind of cool to see, uh, you know, as, as relationships with Gory and, and our members uh, sort of build out. And I mean, I, I can tell you, I actually did get the chance recently to talk to another member of ours, uh, Greer's Home Furnishings, who had the exact location. Uh, we had them on the podcast a couple months ago. They're down in uh, Tennessee and they're, they're 130 years. I, I mean, st similar location. They're located on the same street. So uh, maybe should hook you guys up and, and talk about, you know, what it's like to be that old of a, of a company, but be pretty cool. But, um, you know, for, for you now, you know, as head of Gory, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face, um, you know, running a company that's, uh, you know, 130 plus years old? I think constantly um, telling your story, creating a story that is going to be relevant to your customers and, and so that they not only feel the alignment or feel the passion for what it is that you do, and I think this applies to, to any company, but to be able to uh, tell a future story, to really understand, I mean, you know, start with data, understand what your customers want, but then make sure you're really crafting a story that is, is you know, has the future folded into it. Uh, I think that we really need inspiration today, we, but we need inspiration with purpose. And so that's 
that's for me where we're going. Um, I think COVID has taught us an incredible amount of lessons about our world, about the climate, about, you know, the, the sustainable business practices, uh, you know, social, political. So I think there's quite a lot right now where leaders can be, be leading, you know, with purpose. Um, but that we have to keep the positive and we have to lead with inspiration as well. So those are the two things, two words that I've been using for, for leading in the future. Yeah, no, they make a lot of sense. And I know another one you can kind of tie in there too, um, sort of way to transition and segue is, you know, evolution and adapting. And, um, you know, I know you've talked a lot about that recently and I mentioned the other podcast, podcast circuit you've been on. It's uh, yeah, that's something that's come up a lot and, um, I mean, this pandemic has pushed a lot of leaders. I, I say a lot, you could probably say every leader and it wouldn't be wrong to, you know, some unbelievable limits. Uh, and, you know, what are, you know, as you've kind of evaluated what the retail space has gone through, I, I mean, what are some of the more important impacts that you think this pandemic has had, uh, you know, on the industry and and things that, you know, will sort of live beyond it as, as retail has evolved? What are some of the things that you see have had an impact that will sort of outlast this pandemic? Yeah, a great question. And one that we at Gory have been doing a lot of thought around, uh, you know, thought leadership around the future. Nobody has a crystal ball, but um, as I said, you know, you got to start with that. You got to start with the facts. Uh, You got to listen to what customers uh, are going through and where their comfort levels are, and then start to craft what that's going to look like going forward. Um, the the biggest uh, the biggest challenge I, I see for retailers is that their physical spaces need to be a combination of virtual and uh, a virtual digital and uh, and that they have to come off of the shop floor. Uh, we really need to double down on uh, you know web platforms, app platforms, virtual showrooms. It doesn't mean that the store itself is going to go away, and and if anything especially in the appliance and furniture category, people do want to see it. They do want to feel it. It is a big purchase they'll be making. Uh, and so, you know, there's this, this, uh, this sort of language that's coming out today that's called connected commerce or, and, and that, that, that you really have the ability to have the same experience. Yes, omni-channel is also the word, but it's about um, using digital for convenience and then using physical for experience. As anything, I would say the independent category has some of the best customer service because, you know, they're living and breathing it every day. They are not, um, you know, they're not hiring minimum wage to come in and work shifts. Uh, these are people who love what they do and they really get to understand the products. Um, so those are the things that I, I would say I would really have to figure out how to bring the store into into the office, the living room, the bedroom of the customer through their screens, through it, be it mobile or, or through uh, their PC. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to do because you don't want it to feel, um, you don't want it to feel purely digital. It has to have an element of, uh, of that customer on the other side. So those are some of the, the trends that we're seeing coming out of this uh, is, a, is a virtual showroom and uh, using digital convenience not using it just to have touch screens in your location. So this is something this kind of calls back to, you know, my history of being very in tune with consumer tech and and something uh, you know, that I, I've always been intrigued by virtual reality. Is is this an opportunity where, you know, VR could kind of step in and fill a big gap, giving kind of those customers a chance to experience I, I know, you know, virtual VR adoption isn't necessarily super great. But I mean, an opportunity for them to kind of experience that showroom or, you know, even their home sort of adapted with products and furniture and appliances and things like that. Yes, uh, actually, that's a great question. And one where I do believe that there's a place for it. I think we have to be careful not to use our stores as warehouses anymore. Uh, that's a, that's a, uh, that's what the customer no longer wants to see. They, if they're going to go to the store, and there's a there's a infamous uh, sort of retail researcher named uh, Doug Stevens who who uh, talks about the store being media. And I think when you think about that, you're a giant billboard. You don't necessarily have to have it cluttered like a, you'd find a warehouse. You need you want to create it so that you're really walking them through an experience. 
Uh, and and that experience might be, you know, when we come out of this, cooking lessons and, you know, an open bar and, you know, so, you know an area where you can, you know, do seminars and, and where people can educate on interior design. I mean, all of these are elements that people are really craving when you look at hobbies people took away uh, and, and interesting. Enough. I mean, it doesn't take that long to create a hobby. We've all been locked down at home and been creating some pretty curious hobbies over the last year. Um, and so I think that, that that is, that's where you can really start to use your store as a community. To answer your question about, um, you know, AR, VR, uh, Macy's has done an in life um, environment, which is allowing you to use AR, VR to, you know, superimpose furniture within your space and then to see the product in different colors. So that really does help with the warehouse to, to digital, right? Because you, you don't have to have all manner of different products. Uh, on your store floor, you can create an, a, you know, virtual space that customers can come in and experience. And then, you know, with watch or with, you know, um, with video and, 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 uh, and AR, VR, you know, experience the same thing. No, that makes a, a lot of sense. And I, those examples I know have kind of been around and you see some retailers sort of innovating and playing with them, but uh, definitely feels like a time where it could, you know, sort of, create this mass adoption or, or familiarity, at least with the customer that they'd be more comfortable as you're sitting at home, sort of flipping through instead of scrolling through an app, looking at products, you actually can put it in your home and see what it looks like and uh, ex- experience it digitally uh, in a sense. So that, no, that's awesome. And uh, you mentioned some of the in-store things. Um, yeah, it kind of feels like, you know, that experiential retail shopping um environment was always it's kind of been talked about but now you know coming through covid and seeing what it's done to the the shopping experience it's an opportunity like so many other services to kind of like hit put the gas pedal to the to the floor in that regard and and really look to you know increase adoption around that um so those those experiential um you know shopping environments is that we've seen that trend sort of pick up over time is it you know is it something where now with retailers having gone through this pandemic, you see sort of adoption picking up or is there a lot of work still to be done as far as convincing retailers that that's the way to go? So I think there's a, I think the language around experiential, I don't know that customers, and I think this is part of the studies that we're gonna have to do, but I don't know that customers are going to be 100% uh, ready to, you know, get back into stores um, due to their comfort levels around uh, COVID and distribution of the vaccine. Um, I will say that, yes, I do believe that the element of wanting to be part of thing and, and whether or not, you know, when, when we say experiential and it's, it's cooking classes, or as I, as I alluded to before, it's, it's uh, seminars of, of one thing or another. Um, I think that a lot of environments are going to be used as community centers. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity there for a lot, and, and also for a lot of the community leaders. As an independent business owner, uh, you do have a great community extension. And so this allows for that to to um, you know, to go to the next level, to use your physical real estate as a space to to um, bring more to the community. Whereas um, you know, and and I think that the, the challenge is is to wrap your head around you know the the risks associated with with making that massive change. Um, so, you know, it, it can happen in baby steps. It can happen with your vendor partnerships. A lot of the vendors are also going in this direction where, you know, they want to tell an integrated story. So I think that there's, you know, there's, there's a good way for, you know, the independence with nationwide support and vendors to really start telling that more experiential story. And you kind of started to talk about it there too. I mean, the investment in, and in sort of what needs to logistically happen in a store to make that um, sort of more of a viable option for retailers? Is it, you know, does it have to be big steps? Is it like a, a massive store remake that has to be done? You know, how can a retailer make their store, uh, you know, are there smaller things that a retailer can do to sort of make their store more experiential for a customer coming in? Absolutely. Um, I think that there, it doesn't have to be a holistic overnight change. I think that you can do it in baby steps by, you know, creating environments, um, you know, similar to how Monogram had their, uh, their you know, shop and shop environments. Um, but I, yeah, I think that 
over time though, it does need to feel like holistic to the brand. Um, so it can't just feel, it can't feel piecemeal. Um, but there are steps that can be taken, you know, to a, a call it paint and paper sort of has a little bit more of, uh, you know, an uplift, an uplifted feel to it. Um, and, uh, and I think some of the integrated technology that we spoke about, uh, is where you can, you can play a little bit more with that. Uh, so that you're bringing the digital world into your store, you're using that space as consultation, you know, be it house or Pinterest and, and allowing for the customer to come in and, and, uh, and walk them through it from that perspective. Gotcha. And something you talked about a, a little earlier, you know, that, that certainly rings a bell and, and um, is relevant right now is, you know, it's customers becoming comfortable again with the idea of going out and shopping and, and, um, I, obviously, it's going to take the distribution of vaccine and and things like that, um, you know, before we see sort of a, a return to whatever normal looks like. But uh, from the retail perspective, are there things that you're seeing or is there interest um, on the retail side or, or even just in sort of what you guys are doing to, to stay up on uh, lay, store layout trends? I mean, is there things that can be done to make a customer feel safer sh- uh, from a, a shopping perspective when they re- begin to return to stores? Yeah, you know, funny enough, um, cleanliness is one of the largest um, reasons for a customer feeling uh, comfortable. And so that means having the appropriate, uh, you know, cleaning signage, cleaning mechanism, hand sanitation, those steps, although, you know, it might seem like a questionable, like, do I really need to do this? It, it actually has has been proven to, ha- uh, to sit very high in customers. Uh, comfort levels with going into store. Now that's a very, that's like a preliminary, you know, check the box um, in terms of the customers. Um, I think in terms of environments for, for the retail, we don't yet have enough information of how customers are going to come back. And actually they, they're they starting to show that, you know, they might show comfort in one area, but not in another. So we're doing, and, and by that, I mean, they may be more comfortable with going to uh, you know, a tailgate party for the for the Super Bowl, uh, but they don't want to go into a grocery store anymore. Right. So, and I know that that doesn't specifically answer the question, but I, for the retail environments, I, I think cleanliness is going to be a big one for you know the first the first days that we end up going back. Um, and and really, I think it, it's a matter of making sure that your your uh, your app platform and your in store experience that that customer experience is synonymous because it, there's nothing more frustrating than, um, you know, having one experience on one platform and, and then it not being uh, consistent on the other platform. So, and I think that was one thing that, that really saw an acceleration um, over this last year was that a lot of companies had not pushed the gas pedal on e-commerce or on app platforms. And with, you know, lockdowns and curbside pickup and everything, like that really, it showed, you know, where, you know, those who made the investment and those hadn't, you know, saw a, a bit of a, a gap in the, in the marketplace. And I, I know we could definitely, uh, you know, corroborate some of that with our own data nationwide is just, you know, the number of retailers that had, um, you know, those those services in place sort of, you know, as shutdowns, business were, businesses were forced to close, you know, they ha- they were able to stay open online and have that success. And then just the uh, amount of increased interest and in, in requests for adding those types of capabilities to a website. And, um, you know, preparedness is something that it sounds silly because you never know when you're going to need these things. But at, at this point, online isn't something that you don't know when you're going to need it. It's clear this pandemic proved it, if anything, to those that were sort of still iffy on the idea of a, a, a website or e-commerce capabilities as an independent business, like why need it? Now we know, <laughs> now we know why. And, uh, you know, it's just, um, it's at least encouraging to see that there was that, you know, the ability to adapt and add those services quickly. And, um, you know, for, for independent retailers that maybe were iffy on it, they, they real quickly realized that it was something that they should get involved with. And, um, you know, we're very willing to adapt. That's one thing I love about independent retailers is that, you know, they are, they can, and, and this is, this is their real, um, you know, kryptonite is that they can move so quickly. They're agile. 
Um, and, and, you know, they, 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 they're agile and they've got the passion and, and they're fighters. And so it's very different. It's sort of, you know, the David and Goliath where you're able to move so quickly when it takes other larger national brands more time to move the system over. And I think that's, uh, that's just a, a, a success factor for most independents, most entrepreneurs. No, absolutely. And, uh, one thing I know, you know, I, we talked about it at the top, but uh, you guys, Gory, got involved with Nationwide because of the smart home and the tiny home. And I know that was a big uh, you know, push early on in Houston when you were there at prime time. And uh, cool to see that you know, that's, that's a specific area that gained a lot of interest this year because of you know, smart home technology and people living at home and kind of streamlining that process. Uh, you know, as we look ahead to sort of the rest of this year and whenever we can get you know, back in person, what what sort of excites you about the opportunities and kind of what you guys are doing there, uh, you know, for nationwide members? Yeah, you said we would, we want to make it as easy and accessible as possible. And one of the things that uh, you mentioned before was like, does it have to be wholesale? And uh, so one of the things that we were doing for the nationwide membership was to create a kit of parts that allowed for a story to be told in a, a vignette, but that vignette was branded for the independent. Uh, and then you were able to interchange the partnerships that you have with the vendors to be able to demonstrate to your customer, you know, you might be a, you might have a Google platform, you might have an Amazon platform, but how do we, how do we show how all of these products, be it, you know, whichever vendor you want to partner with can integrate. And so that's a, that's a platform that we've been working on in order to also decrease the cost, making it really affordable, making it really easy and functional to uh, integrate into your existing environment. So that's what we've been working on uh, over the last little bit and, uh, and looking forward to sharing it further with the, with the membership. Awesome. Well, we got virtual prime time up around the corner, but hopefully after that, uh, as vaccine gets out there more and, uh, you know, hopefully in August, we'll, we'll be able to get together in person and finally see another gory uh, presentation at Nationwide. So I actually, I appreciate you taking the time and hunkering down with us and uh, chatting a little bit about, you know, all the things we've seen this past year. And uh, like I said, look forward to catching up with you guys again soon. Rob, it's been uh, awesome talking to you and uh, congratulations to all your members for the hard work over the last year. My goodness, it was uh, not for the faint of heart and uh, it's it's impressive to see the, the positive spirit coming out. Here's to a much better 2021. <laughs> exactly. All right. And a huge thanks again to Ashley for taking time out of her schedule and chatting with us about all these retail trends and things she's watching and how COVID's impacted the shopping experience. So uh, something we were, like I said, very excited to do and uh, had some great insights, you know, talk about technology and possibilities of AR and VR sort of mixing in and pushing the space forward. And, um, you know, just cool to see and, and interested to continue to follow their work in the space and see how independent retailers can capitalize on it. So Again, appreciate her time. Appreciate you listening to the Independent Thinking Podcast, and we will catch you next time.